Oh, come on. <laughs> we all got one. No, what, what do you like to be called? Ah, okay. Or if, like if you were married, I'm the first one to So I'm done. So we're here. Is this all of This is us. We got, we got, a, we got a nice Where is everybody? I'll give a couple of shout outs. Uh, so that's fine. Well, I hope well, well, you have a lot of questions. We got some easy. Where's, where's the camera at? Am I, am I yeah, right? the camera oh, okay, so it's like 360 or something well, like that? Yeah, there's no okay. Follow you. Hey, wait, no Will, follow me? Will okay. 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 this be recorded? Oh, gosh, okay. I shouldn't have said that word. Yeah. Well, good Good morning. Uh, is, I'm C.C. Felker. Uh, welcome to the uh, Naval History Symposium and, and this fine panel. Is it just me or is everybody else tired of World War One? <laughs> okay, they have they had their four years. Okay, now it's our turn. So to for the next twenty years, we own naval history. Okay, as far as I'm concerned, we own it. It's ours. So enjoy it, embrace it. Uh, and I don't think there's a better or clearer benchmark for this interwar period than the topic we're discussing today, the Washington Naval Treaty. I mean, you think about it. The, the conference began in November, right? November of, of 1921, 20 years and a month later, the United States Navy's at war. So, I mean, if you're looking for benchmarks in history, we, we got them, and we get to start out. Uh, if you have ever came to do this morning, he basically just gave away the plot of my paper. No, I did not. <laughs> we can time your battery so, for that. We're, we're gonna go. we're gonna go in alphabetical order, uh, about 15 minutes. Is that okay? Chris, you good with 15? Okay. So we give a lot of time for the uh, uh, for the audience to, to engage. Uh, Chris Kolakowski is director of the Wisconsin Veterans Museum in Madison, Wisconsin. He spent his career interpreting and preserving military history from 1775 to the present and has written and spoken extensively on the subject, including the 2015 and 2017 McMullen Symposium. His latest book, A Study of the 1944 India-Burma Campaigns, will be released in spring 2022. Optional, uh, I asked him to maybe make a few comments on that. His grandmother and great-grandfather served in the Royal Navy during the respective world wars. His great-grandfather served at Jolly. Dr. John T. Kuhn currently serves as Professor of Military History at the Army Command and Staff College and serves as the Fleet Admiral Ernest J. King Visiting Professor of Maritime History for the Hattendorf Historical Center at the U.S. Naval War College from 2020 to 2021. Man, you lose. That's a long title. That's a long title. <laughs> His latest book from ABC Cleo is The 100 Worst Military Disasters in History. They, they aren't the 100 worst. They're just 100 disasters. <laughs> <laughs> Co-authored with David Holden. Finally, Nathan Wells is a former naval officer stationed in Japan and Okinawa and received both his bachelor's in history and master's in military history from Norwich. He was previously an adjunct instructor of history and government at Quincy College in Quincy and Plymouth, Massachusetts, Mount Ida College in Newton, Massachusetts, Massasoit, Massasoit excuse me, Community College in Brockton, Massachusetts, I'm, I'm detecting a pattern here. Newbury College in Brookline, Massachusetts, and Dean College in Franklin, Massachusetts. You don't get out much, do you? Uh, <laughs> Mr. Wells has, has produced book reviews for the National Historical Foundation and HNET. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thank you for three great papers, and I will turn it over to Chris. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Hello from Wisconsin, where it is 7.05 in the morning. So thank you all for the early, early wake up. Uh, but uh, it, it, it is what it is. It's always great to get together, even if virtually, with uh, some great naval historians and to kick off what is going to be a fantastic second day uh, here at McMullen. Um, CeCe's already talked about my ancestors. Um, if you ever get a chance, HMS Caroline was my great grandfather's ship at Jutland, and I was there for the dedication of her as a museum. And it was actually at that moment where you look at the Royal Navy today versus where it was that, that some of the thinking that has presented that you're going to hear me present in a second actually started to crystallize. Um, and so with that in mind, I'm going to dive straight in with the time constraints we have, and I look forward to a fantastic discussion um, once we get to the Q&A. Uh, 
1890, Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan published his landmark book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. While surveying that period, Mahan focused clearly, focused clearly on the Royal Navy as an illustrative examples of his, of his theories of sea power and the importance of naval strength to a nation's fortune. It is then particularly in the field of naval strategy, he wrote, that the teachings of the past have a value which is in no degree lessened. Now, when Mahan wrote his landmark study, the Royal Navy wore the crown as the largest and greatest Navy yet seen on the globe. The United States Navy aspired to develop into a global power and looked to its British cousin as an exemplar of how to proceed. Within 60 years of Mahan's book, the U.S. Navy had succeeded in its goal, even exceeding the Royal Navy's size and stature. For the past 75 years, the United States Navy has worn the crown as the world's leading naval force. Despite challenges from growing powers, the Navy today still fields the most powerful naval force on the planet and finds itself in a broadly analogous position to the Royal Navy of Mahan's time. In the 56 years after Mahan's book, the Royal Navy endured a turbulent period. The service reached its zenith by fighting wars large and small around the world, culminating in victory in World War I. Within three decades after 1918, however, the world's largest and most powerful Navy would cede first place to the USN. This time also saw great technology, technological change, including the founding of a new service with a new dimension of warfare. While adjusting to these changes, the Royal Navy also confronted rising powers around the globe that threatens its status as a global leader. As Mahan did in the 1890s, it is time to once again examine the Royal Navy history to influence the United States Navy's future and development. In this case, to learn the lessons and avoid the pitfall of the Royal Navy's experience. Now, the Royal Navy wore the crown of the most powerful and globally influential fleet throughout the latter part of the 19th century until shortly after World War I without dispute. Four lessons from that period deserve notice by today's Navy leadership. First, value of global basing. Like the U.S. Navy, the Royal Navy was a global force. British ships operated all over the world, could be counted on to be available to protect British interests when called upon. Global basing also proved handy in emergencies like the China Relief Expedition during the Boxer Rebellion of 1900 or to counter Vice Admiral Graf Spee's East Asia Squadron off South, Af South America in 1914. In both cases, the Royal Navy surged ships and personnel to respond to a conflict's outbreak. In addition to war fighting, of course, there's the, diploma, the aspect of diplomacy as well. British sailors often played an important roles as diplomats through direct participation in negotiations, goodwill visits, or hosting local dignitaries. British ships, however, also provided an implied sense of force to back up British interests, perhaps most famously and effectively in the 1918 Fashoda incident between Britain and France. Negotiations occurred aboard General Herbert Kitchener's flagship under the implied power of its guns. Second lesson. Brown water and joint service can be critical to an officer's development. The three commanders of Britain's main battle fleet during World War I, Admirals George Callahan, John Jellicoe, and David Beatty, all contained in their careers significant brown water service or time and billets involved with other services or nations. We call them joint or combined today. Jellicoe was chief of staff of the first ex expedition during the uh, Boxer Rebellion to relieve the legation quarter at Peking in the course of which he suffered a wound and carried a Chinese bullet in his lung for the rest of his life. Callahan commanded an infantry brigade in the second and successful relief expedition. Beatty, the youngest of the three, received rapid promotion resulting from his exploits in the Sudan and in China. As part of the flotilla of gunboats on the Nile River accompanying Kitchener's army to Khartoum, Beatty distinguished himself for coolness under fire. The ship was also the scene of the Fashoda meeting. As a result of this performance, in 1898, he was promoted to commander at age 29. Two years later, he commanded troops in battle in China with success, despite suffering a serious arm wound, winning promotion to captain. In all three cases, these men experienced senior level command in quite complex and demanding environments away from blue water. In each man's biography, this service stands out as essential to his development as an officer and a leader. Lesson three, keep developing technology. During this period, Britain led the way in several key technological fronts. HMS Dreadnought to this audience, I'm sure is very well 
everybody's very well aware of the revolutionary nature of HMS Dreadnought. Uh, British sailors also advanced naval gunnery, although within limitations that I'm sure are aware, well aware to this audience as well. Um, and of course, during World War I, the Royal Navy became the world pioneer in naval aviation and developed the first operational seaplane and aircraft carriers. Sonar, radar, both British inventions. Taken together, all of these developments ensured Britain's place in the early, about 100 years ago, as a matter of fact, in the forefront of technological advances. The fourth lesson is in the end, though, people are the key factor. Great sea stories often turn on the human factor. The Royal Navy in World War I emerged victorious in significant part because of the men who were in the service. The war added to its annals stories of courage and accomplishment like Room 40, the Falklands, Jutland, the Dover Patrol, Evans of the Broke, Victor Crutchley's Victoria Cross, Q ships, and many more. Even the less happy stories like the Chase of the Gobin, Coronel, Gallipoli, and the Battle of the Dogger Bank reinforce the fact that ships are often, often only as good as the personnel that manage and operate them. Britain used these assets to win victory in conflicts around the world through 1918. Indeed, at the end of World War I, the Royal Navy stood unmatched in size and power. It appeared that Britannia would rule the waves for decades to come, but within 30 years, all that had changed. What happened? Well, the reasons the Royal Navy lost its preeminent position are many and varied, but four major ones stand out from the period 1919 to 1945. Number one, the Washington Naval Treaty. 1921, Britain, the United States, Japan, France, and Italy met in Washington to conclude an agreement to forestall a naval arms race between those countries. The resulting naval treaty fixed capital ship ratios of Britain and the United States at 525,000 tons each, with Japan allowed 60% of that total and 35% each allocated to France and Italy. The treaty also limited the sizes and types of ships that could be built and placed a moratorium on battleship construction for 10 years. The treaty's impact was immense as each nation was forced to cancel numerous ships then under construction. Britain alone stopped work on 23 ships and scrapped most of her battle fleet from World War I. Japan felt humiliated, and the British-Japanese alliance ended in 1922. But the biggest implication of the treaty was that the United States Navy and the Royal Navy were now equal in strength. Britain had signed away sole global naval superiority and would never get it back. Second reason, peacetime budgeting. After World War I, the British public mood favored austerity. The Royal Navy's Captain Russell Grenfell explained, quote, the people of Britain set their face against spending money on armaments between the wars. They were prepared to back any policy, expedient, or nostrum that offered reductions of such expenditure, unquote. Because of this attitude, plus the acceptance of the Washington Naval Treaty, Britain did not have enough modern capital ships to answer all the crises it faced during World War II. Global conflict between 1939 and 45 thus stretched the Royal Navy to the breaking point. And more on that in a little bit. The post-1918 mood of economy also caused the British government to create the 10-year rule, a rolling mandate, which set an annual defense budget upon the assumption that no general war would occur for a decade. It started in 1919 and remained in effect through 1933. The Royal Navy thus competed with the Royal Air Force and the British Army for limited resources, which forced very painful choices. Sir Eric Geddes, the first Lord of the Admiralty, wielded the so-called Geddes Axe, which chopped out 2,100 promising officers between 1921 and 23, men who would be sorely missed at World War I's outbreak in 1939. And that's just one of many examples of how these budget reductions impacted the fleet, both in the near term, but also by the time World War I broke out. The third reason, inter-service rivalry. On the 1st of April, 1918, the British Army's Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service merged to form the Royal Air Force, the RAF. After the war, debate raged over which service should control naval aviation since 1921 be known as the Fleet Air Arm. In 1924, the RAF and Royal Navy created the so-called dual control system, where essentially the RAF provided the planes and the Royal Navy operated them from its carriers. The RAF prioritized development of its land-based air assets, leaving the naval aviators to take second place. 
As a result, Britain lost its edge in naval aviation to innovators in the United States, Japan, and elsewhere. In 1937, the fleet air arm returned fully to the Navy, but its aviators entered World War I flying obsolescent planes, including quite a few biplanes, while the RAF operated more modern aircraft, including the Hurricanes and Spitfires, among others. And the fourth reason, overconfidence. Britain entered World War I confident in her fleet's ability to protect the empire. The fleet also had not lost a modern battleship to enemy action in 25 years since HMS Audacious in 1914, which fed a feeling of superiority. Then on 14 October 1939, the German submarine U-47 sank battleship Royal Oak at her moorings in Scapa Flow, shocking the world. U-47 escaped while the stunned and unbelieving British tried to figure out what happened. Worse came on 24 May 1941 when HMS Hood, pride of the Royal Navy and symbol of the empire, tangled with the German battleship Bismarck and was sunk in six minutes of battle in the Denmark Strait. My grandmother, first sea story she ever told me was the Hood and the Bismarck. She knew people who went down on the ship. She had friends that went down on that ship. Ludovic Kennedy said, for most Englishmen, the news of the Hood's death was traumatic as though Buckingham Palace was laid flat or the prime minister assassinated. So integral a part was she of Britain, of the fabric of Britain and her empire. Many people simply did not believe it. Royal Oak took 800 men with her, while all but three of the 1,418 men aboard Hood were lost. The service had forgotten that large capital ships require considerable protection at all times. And past performance is no guarantee of future results. This record inspired overconfidence and British belief in the Royal Navy's ability to defeat the access trickled down to the wardrooms affecting strategy and tactics. This increased the psychological blow of the loss of ships like Royal Oak and Hood, among others. These effects of the interwar period all came together most forcibly when Force Z comprised the HMS Prince of Wales and Repulse plus four destroyers under Admiral Sir Tom S. V. Phillips arrived in Singapore on 2nd December 1941. Singapore and Malaya represented the keystone of the British Empire in Asia. British strategy for Malaya's defense hinged on the entire main fleet arriving from England to assist in the defense of Singapore, and a large naval base had been built on Singapore Island capable of handling the bulk of the Royal Navy. My grandmother had a cousin who was later was deployed to Singapore in early 1942 and stationed in that area before blowing it up before the city's fall. The stated purpose of the garrison and the 141 aircraft in Malaya was to defend the naval base. By the time a fleet was needed for Malaya, however, in 1941, battles in the Atlantic and the Mediterranean had stretched available modern ships to the limit, with little to spare for Singapore. After much debate within the Admiralty, who wanted to send four older battleships, Prime Minister Winston Churchill dispatched Force Z to be, quote, a vague menace to the Japanese, while also confidently declaring Prince of Wales could, quote, catch and kill any light Japanese ship. War reached the Far East on December 8, 1941, with a Japanese bombing raid on Singapore and a landing in northern Malaya and southern Thailand. Phillips sortied Force Z that night to find the Japanese invasion fleet. After a day and two nights of maneuvering without success, he turned for home. At 1100 on 10 December, Japanese warplanes found Force Z east of Kwantan and commenced a series of attacks. Repulse sank at 1232, Prince of Wales at 1320. Admiral Phillips was among the 840 men lost. In less than three hours, 85 Japanese planes had eliminated two of Britain's most powerful ships, the first capital ship sunk entirely by air attack while at sea, defending them. Death of Prince of Wales and Repulse shocked the world and echoes today. Psychologically, Britain and her regional allies never fully recovered from this blow. Force Z's destruction remarked, quote, in fact, the end of an epoch, that of British preeminence as a sea power, according to Captain Grenfell. Militarily, the loss of this fleet knocked out the centerpiece of British defense in the Far East. Australia and New Zealand turned to the U.S. for defense assistance, planting the seeds of today's alliance. As Grenfell explains, the resultant passing of the command of the Southwest Pacific to the Japanese was never redeemed, at least by the British. When redemption came, it was the achievement of the Americans. And this fact continues to influence Asian geopolitics. As World War II progressed, British officers found themselves increasingly dependent on American assistance to carry out plans and operations. 
By 1945, the British Pacific Fleet was a task force in the U.S. Fifth Fleet, and at war's end, the U.S. Navy in the Pacific fielded more World War I-era battleships, so-called old battleships, than the total number of battleships in the entire Royal Navy. The crown of naval dominance had now definitely moved across the Atlantic. Taken as a whole, this story is a storm warning for the United States and its Navy, which rules the waves but faces growing threats from emerging powers. The Navy also needs to be wary of overconfidence affecting strategy and tactics, as it has not lost an aircraft carrier sunk in 76 years or ship damaged by enemy action in 21. Today's naval leaders need to look to the past to both inform the present and influence the future. In this case, <coughs> excuse me, the story of the Royal Navy before 1946 offers much for today's naval leaders to ponder and learn. As we conclude, I leave you with this visual. Today, the U.S. 7th Fleet operates ships out of the former Royal Navy base in Singapore, not far from where Prince of Wales and Repulse rest on the floor of the Gulf of Thailand. The base and those wrecks are monuments to the passing of the British Empire, while also offering warnings to today's Navy leaders. I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I look forward to your questions. You were up, so. Me? Oh, okay. Whenever you're ready. Well, I thought, I thought Nate was going to go ahead. All right. I'm going to actually use this thing. Um, let me kind of sneak over here. Thank you, Chris. That was really great. As I mentioned yesterday, preparatory fires that I can use. Um, and uh, so you're going to, there'll be some repeats here. Um, so I'm John Kuhn. The paper I've written, I, I wrote while I was assigned to the Naval War College in a remote virtual pandemic quarantine status in the Naval War College annex in my basement in Platte City, Missouri. Okay, But I wrote it while I was on the Navy's dime, so I'm giving the Naval War College credit for the, the, the scholarship that, that uh, well, what passes for scholarship that's in this paper. Um, the other thing I want to mention here is sort of a structural methodological thing, really aimed at all scholars, but particularly young scholars, uh, and that's the idea of what do you do when the archives are closed? Well, you find the digital archives. If you don't have boxes and boxes of papers from your dissertation and from your other research left over where you can kind of gather the scraps on the floor and make some new sausage, uh, you have to kind of use the digital archives. And so I relied heavily on, on secondary literature for this paper and, and the digital archives of the cabinet series for the British archives. Um, and so, uh, and, and I had to kind of teach myself how to use that digital resource. So next time you find yourself in a quarantine or a pandemic or locked in your basement by your mother or whatever, <laughs> uh, just go online and, and, and start to teach yourself how to do this stuff. I know I did, and if a 64-year-old man can do it, so can you. Okay, this is the policy level. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about here uh, addresses the same issues that Chris does, but instead of sort of looking at the Royal Navy, I'm going to look at the policy, although he had a lot of policy stuff in, in his piece. I must caveat this with, uh, with uh, you know, the, that one reason, you know, the four reasons that the Royal Navy, you know, loses the crown to the United States Navy, um, and that I am a big supporter, or was a big supporter, because the time is hastening and almost passed, to have a centennial uh, Washington Arms Limitation Conference uh, in Washington, not far from the Vietnam Memorial where the original one was this year, but nobody took me up on my on my idea or even on my paper. Um, so, uh, so I'm a big believer that we should all get together and talk, all right? But that doesn't mean that we don't continue to arm, all right? Because I think the lesson of the Washington Naval Treaty is uh, that uh, if you don't build, you're going to be in a, if you set limits on what you can do and then you don't build to those limits, you are going to be in bad shape uh, as time goes on. We saw that with SALT. We saw that with uh, we saw that with the treaty regime system in the interwar period with Washington and then Geneva. Uh, everybody forgets about the Geneva Conference. Uh, thank God for for Braisted, right? But uh, uh, and then London in thirty, and then London again in thirty-five and thirty-six. Okay, so. Uh, 
So I'm going to give you just a little bit of that that piece before I kind of plow in. And let me let me kind of give you the give it give you my thesis here. In the aftermath of the London Naval Treaty, the U.S. Navy's leadership only increased in its determination to build a battle fleet that would prevail in a Mahanian-style clash with the Japanese fleet somewhere in the Pacific, probably somewhere between Truk and Guam, maybe west of Guam in the Philippine Sea. All right, so that's the Navy that the, that the United States Navy is building. The British approach, on the other hand, was increasingly determined by events in Europe. So I am this paper deals with British policy for imperial defense in the Far East, all right? But that policy was not in a vacuum. It had to live in a global vacuum. And that kind of goes to what Chris is saying for Navy leaders today. We're not in a vacuum uh, in the Pacific with the Indo-Pac. We are in a global situation. And so when you start to discount those other factors that affect global strategy, you're going to get into trouble. And the British case is obviously a case of that. Uh, the Americans also, but more the British, as Chris has already argued. So British, British path was an economy of force, and more and more an economy of force, all right, uh, to where she essentially adopted what I characterize and define as a fortified fleet in being approach, which is we're going to have a fleet in being. It's going to be based out of this fortress at Singapore, which is going to be protected by air substitution uh, by the Royal Air Force, as, as advocated by guys like Air Marshal Trenchard, and it's going to be protected by the jungles and and everything of the Malay Peninsula. The British Army and 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 uh, is going to be taking a back seat, sort of this fortified fleet and being plus air power with air power as a substitution for both land power and sea power. That's the British approach, okay? Now, whether or not the British understood it as that being the approach is a whole other story, but that's when we do the analysis goes back to what the approach was, a fortified fleet and being approach. Uh, this fleet and being reflected an aggressive naval defense, all right? This is not a passive defense. Uh, we're gonna be based in Singapore, we're gonna have the Royal Air Force out there with squadrons and squadrons and squadrons, um, and we're going to dominate this area of the Far East in a defensive status until we can come up with a more aggressive and offensive approach to figure out how to get the Japanese to do whatever it is we want uh, that's caused war to break out with the Japanese. The Japanese are clearly the threat that Great Britain is focused on here. The one power standard uh, that the British keep talking about in the interwar period, this is the period between World War I and World War II, the, the power they're talking about is Japan. All right. Now, I'll deal with the United States as that other power, but the real threat in the one power standard is Japan. All right. The one power standard. Okay. And uh, events in Europe only enforced British imperial security policy that underwrote this approach. In other words, this is one of those approaches which, which is, it, it, it offers sort of this secret sauce that this is going to solve all our problems. And as things come up in Europe, this approach will still accommodate that because of this myth of the impregnable fortress of Singapore with a powerful British fleet based on it, supported by modern, powerful squadrons of aircraft. Okay, So that's what these guys are thinking about when they're doing security policy. All right, We've already talked about the, the, the Washington Treaty. Um, the, the thing I want to talk about with respect to uh, with respect to uh, the Japanese here, and Chris mentioned it, the Japanese are having none of it, okay? They they have been limited to a fleet that is, is six-tenths the size of the American and British fleet. So the way the Japanese look at it is that we've got a fleet that's three-tenths the size that it needs to be to do the math, right? Uh, because the Japanese always, particularly Kato Kanji, the leader, the young, fiery leader of the fleet faction in Japan, Kato Kanji, his, his view is that the Anglo-Americans are going to be allies no matter what. If push comes to shove and Japan gets into a war uh, over its policies in East Asia, the Americans and the British are going to make common cause against them. So their attitude is we absolutely need naval parity. And so uh, a large proportion inside the Japanese Navy, the fleet faction, particularly the young officers, 
uh, are going to going to regard the Washington Naval Treaty as a declaration of war against Japan by the United States and Britain. And they behave that way for the rest of the interwar period. The other key thing is that these, this faction, the treaty faction, the militarized faction, the hawks, if you will, are going to make key alliances with the hawks in the army, particularly in the imperial way faction inside the army, which also has this very, very militarized hawkish approach towards foreign policy of Japan in the globe and, under, and, and supports this. So when, when we get into the season of assassinations in the 1930s by the Japanese, in response to the naval treaties, we'll see a lot of army, young army officers out assassinating admirals and prime ministers in the 1930s in, in opposing these treaties. Okay? So the Japanese response to the treaty system is, is pathological. All right, it, it, and so I, I agree with Chris that, that the treaty system is, is gonna is gonna have all these unintended consequences. Although it seems in the 1922s that everything is, is working well enough in the 1920s. But I think that's the diplomatic community and the policy community kind of kind of seeing things through rose-colored lenses, all right, particularly for the Kellogg Breon fact, which comes about in 1928. All right, well, let's return to the British. Okay, it's Stephen Roskill, uh, the, the great British historian of this period and also of World War II uh, of the Royal Navy, has called this the period of Anglo-American antagonism. But when we really get into, into his books, as well as the cabinet series of papers that I talk about, we find that's not what's going on, okay? Uh, the, 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 the Americans are a budget enemy to build to because they're the Navy second to none that's been granted parity by the Washington and then reaffirmed at the London Treaty, right? So we, the United States Navy is the benchmark, you know, we, we, that, that, we, that, that we can go with our naval estimates to the government with, but the threat, the power that we're building against is Japan, right? Germany's nowhere on the horizon. Italy is nowhere on the horizon. They've been limited by treaty to, uh, to, to like 1.75, you know, times the size of the American and the British fleets, as have the French, all right? So a clear indication of the British Naval Officer Corps view of this is, uh, is Admiral of the Fleet uh, Earl Beatty. Uh, he reported to the cabinet that Japan was a threat in the Far East, okay? This is in 1924 in February. Um, he's often regarded, Beatty is often regarded as hostile to the United States, but listen to these words of Admiral Beatty. Uh, Japan might see Singapore at some future point and threaten our oil fuel storage, the ports of Colombo, Trincomalee, Madras, and Rangoon. All right. So, so the, Japan is clearly the threat that the Royal Navy is worried about. Um, and nonetheless, uh, the proposed scheme to proceed with improvements to Singapore that Beatty and the First Lord of the Admiralty supported in 1924, 1925 was not supported because it was not in the keeping of the spirit of the Washington Naval Treaty. That's a direct quote. Uh, in fact, Beatty and the senior, senior board of the Admiralty almost resigned because of the failure to adopt the scheme to build this fortified fleet and being infrastructure to include uh, stationing more aircraft squadrons in Singapore. Uh, their clear divergence existed between the politicians and the Naval Officer Corps. And I'm going to mostly focus on the politicians. So this is papers really at the policy level. After the failure of the Geneva Conference, which supposedly failed over the issue of cruisers between the United States and Great Britain, the, the problem was essentially solved because uh, the British Prime Minister came over and sat down with President Herbert Hoover and the General Board of the Navy in the White House and worked out the, the so-called uh, 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 cruiser formula right, uh, how we can resolve the cruiser. And this was really about the basing thing that Chris was talking about, which is how do we resolve British shorter range, lighter cruisers, uh, and many bases with the American requirement to build long range, 10,000 ton, eight inch gun, biggest possible cruisers under the treaty regime system. And the Americans and the British, the, 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 uh, the sort of poster of Anglo-American antagonism goes away in 1929 when Anglo-American cooperation, which the Japanese had always feared and said was a thing, became a reality in 1929, when uh, I think it was Ramsey McDonald and Herbert Hoover uh, agreed to the thing. Okay. 
So London and after. London and after. So this is going to go pretty fast. After the London Naval Conference, uh, the Japanese revolt. They officially revolt against the global system. They begin assassinating prime ministers. Uh, they go into Shanghai in 1932. The government negotiates with Chiang Kai-shek. And another prime minister gets assassinated. Uh, and, and the Japanese basically pull out of the, out of the Washington and London naval treaty system. At the same time, the cabinet is dealing with this issue of the of the 10 year rule that Chris talked about in 1933. And Chris got the date right. Uh, they formally agree that the that the that the 10 year rule no longer applies. But the again, the security threat is Japan. Now, what happens to undermine all of this? And I'm going to do some math here. Is what happens in Europe? It, what also occurs in 1933? Right. Here, Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany. In the following year, he abandons the Locarno Pact, which kind of is a verification that Germany is not going to wage aggressive war, at least against France or Belgium anymore. And he renounces the Treaty of Versailles. The British are scrambling here. Uh, they get to the point where they, they say, well, we should all get together with the Germans and bring them into the naval treaty system. That does not happen. That does not happen. In fact, the French are worried that the British are going to cut a deal separately with the Germans. So the British do. The way this affects Singapore, though, is it affects the fleet. Now we've got another German. But the British think they solved that problem with the Anglo-German Naval Treaty in 1935. The, the problem is they're still not building. They're still having problems producing things. They're still relying on air power to, to kind of fill the gaps. Uh, they haven't deployed a fleet to Singapore. The infrastructure in Singapore is not improved. In fact, on December 7th, 1941, Singapore can't handle uh, the size British fleet that the plans say it should handle. They only have berths for three capital ships in Singapore at the time. Uh, the, the, the guns that are set up, the Singapore, where Singapore's ports and, and all the infrastructure is based, is completely in the wrong location if the Japanese advance down the Malay Peninsula with an army. All right. And then the whole idea that we're going to get all these airplanes goes away when the German Luftwaffe sucks up the air power assets for home defense uh, under guys like Air Marshal Dowdy. So then the Italians add to the picture. So think of the math here. So, well, we're going to limit the Germans to about one third the size of the British Navy. So there's one third of the, now you've got two thirds of the British Navy to go east and fight the Japanese. That's parity. With the Italians, that fatally compromises that plan. Okay? Uh, even though the British are still believing the impregnability of Singapore and air power are going to even the odds, it doesn't. Okay. Now with Italy, the sea lines of communication to India and the engines of the empire are a real problem. And by 1936, 1937, the British are going to have to hold back a third of the fleet to deal with the Italians. Then they go, no, the French will do that. But in 1940, France falls. And the fleet is no longer available. All right. Also, the German fleet occupies a lot more of the British Navy than the British had planned for. So this entire house of cards in the Far East that's built on Singapore begins to fall. There's just one thing left, which is the impregnability of Singapore. The British, uh, a giveaway, and this is in Richard Frank's new book, Tower of Skulls, the British appoint an air, a retired air chief marshal, uh, uh, Brooke Popham. As the, uh, as the commander in the Far East. He's an air guy. And it's only in November 1941 that they go, oh, our real problem is land-based power and preventing the Japanese from driving down the Kra Ishma, Isthmus and the Malay Peninsula. And so they actually appoint a ground commander. But when the Japanese attack on December 8, 1941, across the International Date Line, uh, it's an airman who's in charge of British defense. Now, I don't need to go over lost ground. The, the British do deploy Force Z, Force Z under Tom Phillips at the 11th hour to the Far East to sort of begin the nucleus of that thing. But it's actually deployed as a deterrent. They're still thinking they can deter the Japanese. The British deploy the repulse, or is it the repulse or not? Anyway, they, they, they deploy the repulse in the Prince of Wales. They deploy Force Z. Uh, after the Japanese have already made the decision for war. 
And then the Nagoya Air Group goes out there and sinks both of them in the Gulf of Siam. And the entire system is undermined. All right, the entire system is undermined. So the fortified fleet in being strategy uh, briefed well, but did not work when faced with geopolitical realities. I'm finished. I'm out of time. I think we can talk about some of the relevancies here to our current situation during the questions and the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. See if I can get a presentation going, which usually makes things go faster. Worse with worse. Yeah, I'm sorry, sir. We uh, did not, we did not get the slide. Your your email includes W E L L E S. Uh, uh, yeah, it's close. Well, we got from my email because it's sent much quicker. Your email is. Uh, logical email that I'm trying to C H A I O N G E M I N I seven six at hotmail dot com. Okay. All right, so I'll be talking about the Wash Naval Treaty. Depends on the word. So, so we've watched New Hope, we've watched Return of the Jedi, now I'm going to make the Dark Vader of the Empire Strikes Back still exciting. So, <laughs> I know we're trying to get past World War One, but I have to start a little bit in the past, and that is in 1916. 1916 is two big disparate events happening with President Woodrow Wilson. One, is that he is launching a naval building program, which initially he says to build incomparably the greatest navy in the world. Realizing that he's hoping to have a peaceful postal world, he does walk it back a bit and change the official speech to incomparably the most adequate navy in the world, full downgrade in the recommendation. Uh, the reason he's doing that is because he's also running for re-election that year against Charles Evans Hughes, not the second, uh, and he says that uh, he, he makes us look like in this close election that Hughes might lead us into the first world war. So he says that of himself, he kept us out of war. And as he has to joke to my students, you know, how do you know if a politician or a lawyer is lying, their lips are moving. There's some <laughs> campaign promises that are nowhere near, but arguably the most false campaign promise possibly ever is Woodrow Wilson's he kept us out of war, because six months later we get involved in the greatest war in history at that point. Now, we're going to World War One. we get into it, depending on who you think, or either are important in the beginning of it, or we're just kind of there in the time to glory. But we are on the victorious side. Yay. Now, Wilson is hoping that we will be involved in a post-war world, the League of Nations, and he oversees the Treaty of Versailles to end that war, wants to get involved in the League of Nations, comes back, gives a great speech to be involved post-war. If we don't do this, there'll be another war in generation. And unfortunately, he doesn't bring everyone he should. One of the people he leaves behind in the U.S. of A is a senator from my home state in Massachusetts, Henry Cabot Lodge, who is unfortunately for Wilson the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, does not like Wilson, feeling he's neutral. So Wilson gives us a brief speech, nations. what do you say, Henry? And Henry says, nope, not going to do it. Uh, he says, the United States is the world's best hope, but if you fetter in the interest and quarrels of other nations, if you tangle her in the intrigues of Europe, 
you will destroy her power for good and endanger her very existence. Leave it to march freely through the centuries to come as in the years have gone. Strong, generous, and confident, she has nobly served mankind. Beware how you trifle with your marvelous inheritance, this great land of ordered liberty. For if we stumble and fall, freedom and civilization everywhere will go down in ruin. So no League of Nations for the United States. No League of Nations for Versailles either. We don't even end the war under Wilson's watch. Uh, it's going to have to be the next administration, which is going to be Juan G. Harding, who wins a rather easy victory in 1920 on a campaign of a return to normalcy. Land campaign, but it wins a big victory uh, for himself and Calvin Coolidge over James Cox and Franklin Delroy Roosevelt. Delroy and Pierre Lincoln White Hope eventually. Now, it's ironic that he talks about Hughes as potential leading to the war because Hughes is going to oversee these great diplomatic moments of the 1920s, so called New Era Diplomacy. Um, and the New Era Diplomacy gets, in some ways, a bad rap. We talk about Washington Naval Treaty with a few loopholes, in some ways, it starts or leads to more problems uh, than it solves. There's the Kellogg Beyond Pact, which outlaws war, but doesn't really come up with a way to end war. There's the old Rob Williams joke that the difference between American and British cops, American cops, stop or I'll shoot! British cop, stop! Or I'll say stop again. And that's really the degree of that. It doesn't give away the sort of end of further conflict. You have the Dawes Plan, which is a way to try to rebuild Europe by investing in certain industries and certain companies, or say the Marshall Plan, you just give money away and sort of hope that works out, which works better. So, these are some of the problematic uh, examples of New Era diplomacy. But in the Washington Naval Treaty, looking at it as well as part of the later naval treaties, which we already mentioned, the two Geneva Conventions, the one, and the two London Conventions, and I'll talk about one in a little bit too. Um, we do see that Hughes really led to some uh, great changes. Uh, Hughes, it's Warren G. Harding's the president, he's obviously the VIP, he gives the first speech. Um, when the delegates show up, not only is it the Washington Naval Conference, the other thing that happens that week is the dedication of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, which most of the delegates represent will see. End of a war, tragedy, someone, a soldier, a, a first a serviceman known only to God. We can't let this happen again. We know that the naval arms race was key to bringing this conflict, and we need to prevent this from happening. So a somber moment. Uh, Hughes is really the man of the plan. He is the head of this delegation. Uh, and the fellow uh, counterparts of the major nations, so Great Britain is uh, represented by Arthur Balfour, that we talked about here today. Uh, France is represented by Abitello, uh, Italy by Carlo Shanza, and Japan by Tomoso uh, Tomosoburu. Uh, and with the Japanese especially, we're going to see a conflict. There's going to be what's called the War of the Two Tentos. Uh, Kenji Tomosoburu, who is about a naval sermon, and Kibakanji, who is not. He believes in the big navy. And he's important because, as we'll see later on in the 1930s, his viewpoint becomes standard. He's also got a protege named Federico Yamamoto, who we'll definitely talk about more later on. Now, the Washington Naval Treaty is composed of a few different treaties. So it's a five power treaty, which is what we usually think about. These are the five major nations I talked about, as well as a four power treaty, which is most of those, as a nine power treaty, which is most concerned about the Chinese uh, overdue policy. So it's really everyone who, who is represented. And Harding starts off the cuisines with a nice speech. He's good about speeches that say a lot about nothing. Uh, Hughes gives his speech. And initially, it sounds the same. He's a Secretary of State. He needs to preserve peace and this and that. And then he pauses, and most of the delegation, most of the representatives, especially the British, think he stopped. Or he said, it's good, we should stop talking. And he takes a breath, and he starts round two. He gets a second win. And he says, the only way to disarm is to disarm. We all need to end the production of capital ships. Capital ships should be stopped production for 10 years across the board. All navies should slash. We don't need the disarmament. And the British are horrified because they did what they did not. Now, Hughes is the head of the delegation, and he has some good um, support. He has Elihi Root, former Secretary of State, Secretary of War as well, uh, who helps reform the Army establishment, creating the Army War College at West Point. Uh, he brings along Henry Cabot Lodge, uh, doesn't make Wilson's mistake, as well as Oscar Underwood, Senator from Alabama, who was a senior Democrat for the Republican Party. So he had both sides of the Senate. So whatever he makes happen here, we'll probably get stamped by the Senate, which is important, treaties and all that. Now, they have three major goals. One, naval disarmament, ending the capital ship production. Two, limiting Japanese expansion and fortification of bases in the Pacific, which we already started, and spoiler alert, before that didn't happen. And third, to end the Anglo-Japanese treaty and make Britain go further into the United States camp. 
which does happen. The downside, especially if the Japanese are fortified bases, now you have a greater chance at fighting uh, that nation. Now, Japan is going to be angered, as we talked about before, because of the shipping ratio. Five, five, three. Well, technically, five, five, three, one, seven, five, one, seven, five. Uh, 175 and 175 are Italy and France, which are going to get involved in a, using an arms race, a naval arms race in the Mediterranean. Of course, when Italy becomes uh, a, you know, a rival power and France falls, now Britain has to worry about the Mediterranean, which is a major lifeline. So some major treaty terms. You have the 553 ratio. Uh, capital ships, battleships and battle cruisers, which is you know, a large heavy vessel, 35,000 tons or above. Uh, no production for 10 years. There are going to be a few exceptions. Uh, one of these major exceptions are aircraft carriers, which luckily nobody really knew what to do with. We knew they were important, we didn't know how to use them, they were there. Um, they uh, could be limited to only 27,000 tons. Uh, they had a control of 8 inch guns. Uh, very few, not going to use them, they're, they're aircraft. Uh, but if you wanted to, if you had a couple of extra capital ship hulls lying around, like if you're involved in a major build build building program, or or, uh, you could convert two of them into aircraft carriers. And you can see that. Um, now, when these demands, when these uh, comments come out, there is you know, some anger. Those who are about naval retirement, saving money, and saving peace, are happy. Those who are not, say the kanji and others, uh, are very unhappy. And it's not just in Japan, there are other uh, naval points around the world who are angry about this. Uh, when I last spoke uh, at this symposium, this uh, symposium four years ago, I was talking about Wilson, Pershing, and Sims in World War One. And Pershing and Sims, Pershing was you know, the, the sort of the, the tough nut, you know, the hard fighter, uh, bring the scouts you know, to the war because he wanted to make sure that our allies knew they weren't going to use Americans just as sort of spare bodies. We were going to do a separate thing. Whereas Sims was uh, more placid, he was going to work with the Royal Navy. Here is the reverse. Pershing, having seen firsthand just the carnage of war, is all for disarmament, naval and otherwise. Whereas Sims is sort of a foreshadowing to the revolt of the Admiral 25 years later. He's like, no, we need battle cruisers, we need big cattle ships, right guys? And he finds himself alone. And he's still just to go back to the Naval War College and just keep flying the beach. So whether we should disarm or not is a major, uh, major criticism because it's, it hinges on everyone agreeing to disarm. Now, if everyone agrees to disarm, there are some benefits. Uh, if everyone agrees to disarm, you could use this as a way to modernize your fleet, as long as you're, oh, all right, great. You gotta go back a um, little further. More, keep going, more, 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 spoilers, more, more. Um, oh, more, yeah. All right, here's watching the tree, keep another one. Going. Another one. All right, so we have the 553 five, ratio. Great Britain, the United States, and Japan. This one. So here's the uh, what the uh, tree says. Tons ratio 553, five, 175, 175. Capital ships, battleships, and battle cruisers, 35,000 tons, guns lower, larger than 16 inch. Uh, and 16 inches going to be the key. Uh, Air compressed 27,000 tons. Uh, you can use two existing hulls or one. And carriers lighter than 10,000 tons were kind of experimental and they were counted. So you can you know, really build as many carriers as you want if you kept them smaller. All right, everything else uh, 10,000 tons or less, a maximum size of eight inches. What this treaty doesn't really cover, and this is why I call it the you know, passing the baton, passing the torch, is it focuses on capital ships. Ancillary vessels, cruisers, destroyers, is going to be hashed out at Geneva and at London. Especially London, we'll talk about that in a bit. Is the sacrifice of you know of naval power, you know, for the good of, of, of peace, this, this huge fleet. Uh, we're not going to build it. So you can go hang on your barrel, little Sam, that you're going there with all your great ideas and you're leaving this this naked. But there is, you know, there are benefits. If everyone abides by the treaty, keep your tip, you can use this to rebuild your fleet. You can Modify vessels to another purpose, making a training vessel. Uh, the one exception to World War I battle fleet that didn't make it to World War II is Jellico's flagship, Agent Iron Duke. They took the uh, armor belt off on the turret, and she's a training ship, so she does survive into the Second War, but not as an actual first rank battleship. Uh, you could you know, replace an older battleship with a new one. 
So you could keep your fleet on par with others, newer technology, by just stopping it. You could sell it, you could scrap it, uh, or you could modify it. Um, being that all the countries, the major powers that have signed this treaty are democracies, it means that they have to deal with some type of bureaucracy. So scrapping a ship also takes manpower, also could lead to, uh, to jobs. And Britain realizes that she couldn't keep up with American, uh, American manufacturers. Uh, the one area Britain was stymied was that she wanted to outlaw submarines, not surprising, and she was thwarted by the French because the French saw this as a way of bulking up their naval power. We think of fleet submarines, we think of the United States, Japan, but the French took a large sub, strapped a cruiser turret on it, and saw this as a deterrent. Uh, they're going to get the naval arms race in the Mediterranean with Italy, who took a slightly different way of underwater warfare. Uh, basically, double divers and ride a torpedo to do damage <coughs> on ships. Uh, and one of the things we'll talk about in 1941 is the raid on Alexandria. We're going to table two Roman battleships. Next slide. Uh, this is USS Arkansas. She's the oldest uh, battleship that's been serviced in World War II the United States. She had 12 12 inch guns, six turrets. And she's sort of uh, the, one of the last standards of that era, the Cajun master of her era. Um, what uh, you could do to abide by treaty this is, and modify it. This is her older sister, Whammy, uh, and she was cruising up and down the Chesapeake in World War II. But, oh, okay, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, as the Chesapeake Raider, they took out her big guns, put lots of alien aircraft weapons on it, and she trained in the aircraft gunners, which came very handy when we talked about the Now, in terms of aircraft carriers, these are battleships, and then we see the battle cruiser, this is Lexington. Battle cruisers tend to be much larger than battleships because instead of having lots of armor, they could put a big engine to go faster. So the Lexington's are going to be larger than uh, battleships. We'll see the uh, HMS Hook the same thing. So here she is in her initial version. And then to be converted to an aircraft carrier, I used to teach in Quincy, Massachusetts, so this is just the students involved. And then with her sister Saratoga, and these are massive vessels. I mean, instantly, fleet carriers, lemon, uh, on the lemons, uh, the smaller Langley, which is the first American aircraft carrier, a little smaller, former coal vessel, which is a five planes on her. And by World War II, she's just a seaplane carrier, so she's not a first gun carrier. Technically, our first aircraft carrier was a converted coal uh, barge in George Washington Park Custis, which launched balloons in the Civil War. Just imagine taking a lot of these dangers on the background. This is the USS Colorado. She is the lead ship of the 16 inch gun, the uh, Colorado class, and these were the, the most powerful vessels allowed until the Washington Naval Treaty hit. These were the most powerful vessels until we get to the North Carolinas. Uh, this is the Nagato. She and her sister ship, uh, Mutsu, with the Japanese counterparts. In fact, her sister ship was being built as the Washington Naval Treaty was being signed. They're kind of rushing production. They were like, oh, she's almost done. She's almost here. She's ready to get her under the, uh, under the wire. And uh, this is the Nagato and the Japanese ships that would have followed her. The, uh, this is the Tosa class, uh, which would have been uh, the next stage on. Uh, the Tosa class uh, ship Kaga was converted to an aircraft carrier, as was the Amagi class bound cruiser Akagi. So again, uh, there's one third of your Koha to strike force. Uh, and then the following on Key and 13 class, which would have been almost the size of the Sasha. Uh, is bound cruiser HMS Hood and Nelson and Rodney. Uh, these are the six inch iron battleships allowed to the Royal Navy because the United States and Japan had those vessels. And you can just see the, how long the hood is compared to these two. So she's a very large vessel, massive ship, and it's unstable why her loss uh, hit the British Navy so hard. Now, conclusion anniversary of the Washington Naval Treaty, anniversary of 1931, which is when everything uh, really uh, goes into the, and also 1941, a terrible year for capital ships. Uh, if I back it up to 1940, which I'm going to because I'm giving a talk, so a lot of statistics. From November 1940 to December 1941, 17 capital ships are sunk or disabled. Only two are the old fashioned way of gunfire, Hood and Bismarck. Three are sunk by underwater weapons. HMS Barn is sunk by torpedo. HMS Queen Elizabeth and Valiant are damaged by those Italian sub -dives. 13 are sunk or disabled by air attack. Sorry. So the Red to Toronto, the uh, ferry swordfish, the stream bags, they sink the Italian battleship. Cut to Devore and Vittorio. Luckily for the Italians, it's a shallow inner harbor, so they could be floated and stored. Next one. Uh, Germans took dive bombers, safety three battleships, Lemnos and Kilkis, 
If you don't see strange looking cage masks, those are indicative of American fashion. These are the former USS Mississippi and Idaho. We, we sold them to the treaty, got some money, uh, and much of the money went to the new US Idaho, which is New Mexico class. So then the way you could do it, modify ship, or you could sell it off. Uh, and these are sunk in Greek waters by German Stuka's Avalons. Stuka's also sank the Russian battleship Petropavlov. Uh, this is HMS Hood after the, uh, the killing hit by uh, Bismarck as the Prince of, Prince of Wales to pass him. Again, all but three men were killed on uh, when she sank in a family shot. Uh, HMS Barham being hit by a torpedo, she rolls over and her uh, ammunition is blown up. Uh, and finally, Pearl Harbor. The battleships uh, Arizona, Oklahoma, California, and West Virginia are sunk to them permanently, which is you know, the conclusion of this, this uh, harbor terrible year. But there's still one more to go. Uh, HMS Repulse, and behind her, it was Prince of Wales being sunk as part of the Polar Sea. But sunk by air power, which most of the war. So, how things have changed uh, in the 20 years since the Washington Naval Treaty. Now, this is also the conclusion of you know, that decade that uh, angered Japanese. I just want to leave you with one quote. Uh, in the London Naval Conference, uh, Isabel Yamamoto was talking with a Ministry of Finance official, Kaya. Okay, Nobody. And Nobody was saying, you know, we need to focus on the cost of naval disarmament. We can save money. And Yamamoto looked at him with that serene gaze and said, say another word and you'll get a smack in the face. So that 10 years from 1930 to 1941, you know, both the naval assets and the, uh, the army was just the dominant effect of going to leave within the country. Apologize for technical difficulty. I'm trying to explain. Thanks. We have uh, 30 minutes left. We'll listen to that. So I'm going to open it up uh, to the audience, both in person, and we've got 10 folks. Can they, can they ask questions? Yes, sir. If you use the QA function online, uh, under the, it's a little shaped icon for those online viewers. Okay, so if you're online, if you use the QA function, you can uh, ask our panelists questions as well. So, yes, sir. So I have a question for John. Um, I was struck by the, the lack of U.S. Navy, Royal Navy coordination in the run-up to World War II, right? In the Far East is what I'm talking about. Um, there was very low levels of talks. Uh, you know, the uh, Asiatic fleet sent their chief of staff, a captain, to go talk to a Royal Navy people about, hey, what are we going to do if things happen? They brought the Dutch in for some discussions with that, but it really didn't come up with too much. Um, so in the end, you have Tom Phillips scrambling, flying up to Manila just days before the war starts. Yeah, Sprint, you know, yeah, that's where he, he yeah. learns the Japanese are kind of on their way, and he flies back down. Um, so, so can you kind of explain the dichotomy of what they wanted, which is, hey, we're going to work with the Americans in the Pacific, and then the lack of uh, any coordination? Well, actually, and again, I think it's in this paper. It might be in another paper I wrote or another chapter I wrote for a book. Um, uh, the actual staff-to-staff -staff talks actually do occur earlier, but they occur they occur uh, in in Washington and in London, and they're informal. the The problem is here is we want uh, there's a great book by Gwen Wilford called Racing the Sunrise, and and the, and the United States and Britain realize we've got to buy time. Uh, we've got to keep Japan out of the axis. We you know, the, the Europe first strategy has already been determined, all right, uh, by 19, by, after the fall of France and in the ABC conference that occurs in Washington in, in 1940 and then January 1941. Uh, so, but earlier than that, there were already informal talks. They, they did not want to provoke the Japanese into an earlier war by having sort of a public formal alliance. Similarly for the Dutch. The Dutch kind of prevaricated between sort of well, we're going to be neutral. We don't want to provoke the Japanese to, oh, shit, we better start coordinating with everybody. Um, so so some of this is diplomacy, brinksmanship of trying to buy time by not provoking the Japanese. Guam is a great yeah. example of that. Uh, do we fortify Guam, or, do, or will that provoke the Japanese into going to war with us much earlier, which is going to cause a real problem on the other side of the globe, because now uh, the Japanese will be joining the Axis and joining in the war. And then once the Soviet Union becomes involved, it becomes even more uh, urgent to keep the Japanese out of the war. 
uh, because uh, the Soviet Union is going to tie down the Wehrmacht, which is a good thing, all right? Uh, you know, it, 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 it's the Soviet Union that defeats the Wehrmacht. So, and this is all understood by Churchill, by Stalin, by Chiang Kai-shek, and by Roosevelt. It's, it is understood. And Rich Frank's scholarship now on all this is, is fascinating. He's, he's got the Tower of Skulls book out. He's also going to be in an anthology that Chris Bell and Eric Goldstein are going to come out with where he talks about all of this. Um, so, so they don't want to provoke the Japanese. So that's why all this 11th hour stuff kind of takes place. Uh, that's sort of the, the, the explanation. The other thing is it's a very, very busy time. Uh, there's so much else going on. Um, and if it seems like it's sort of last minute, it is. I mean, the, 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 the British are on their asses in the Mediterranean in 1941. It, it's a horrible time for the British in the Mediterranean. The British who had never thought that they might lose the war in the Mediterranean are facing the fact they might lose the war in the Mediterranean. You know, I mean, where's where Slim? Slim is in Iraq, all right? William Slim, who later comes to Burma to participate in the retreat. Um, so, uh, so it's a very careful time. There was a quote that I wanted to give you that kind of gives you a feel for, for how this sort of slow train wreck of catastrophe is moving. It's from a cabinet meeting in 1934, okay? So, uh, and it's and it's by the first Lord of the Admiral Admiralty, Monsell. The defense of our empire necessitated a minimum of the maintenance of the one power standard. Okay, well, what is the one power standard? Against the United States or Japan? My argument, Japan. Okay, back to what he said. Our annual building programs were formulated, and our existing deficiencies had been calculated with strict reference to that standard. If our building could not be carried out, and equally, if our deficiencies could not be made good, the one power standard could not be maintained. If that standard were to be abandoned, we could not defend the empire, and we might as well have no Navy at all. This is in 1934 in a cabinet meeting, all right? So I, it, to say that the British didn't see the catastrophe coming is nonsense. They saw it. Uh, and, and Monsell is commenting on a, on a report of the Committee of Imperial Defense. The 10-year rule had delayed all of the naval estimates. And there were, and the Treasury, uh, the Chancellor, the Exchequer, came back and said, and said, well, you know, uh, so, okay, we'll adjust the naval estimates. And they said, well, what about all the naval estimates that you didn't meet in the previous six years to 1934, when Churchill really implemented, remember, Churchill was the Chancellor of Exchequer, who really brought the hammer down in the mid 1920s with with the 10 year rule? Now Churchill abandons it by 1929. Okay, but he's not in government anymore either, is he? So uh, so so this whole deal with how are we going to deter the Japanese from going to war is it, it becomes it sort of it drives the train and prevents the kind of staff to staff talks that need to occur in the Far East. But they're against this very complicated political dynamic. And we're not just dealing with the British and the Americans. We're dealing with the Empire, with the Australians, with the New Zealanders, who 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 are who actually up their building and their uh, uh, their budgets to help pitch in cruisers and destroyers and and submarines to to the problem to turn this fleet and being into Singapore. And the Dutch finally agree to abandon their very innovative approach to using wolf packs of submarines with. Uh, with, uh, with seaplane reconnaissance to attack Japanese invasion convoys. They abandoned that in favor of going with sort of the big fleet uh, based in Singapore approach uh, and, and into a naval alliance with the British. And a lot of this is formalized in the Manila conferences. There's not just one. The one you mentioned about Phillips is sort of the last one, right? But there were several conferences in Manila and Singapore where this occurred, okay? But a lot of this is contingent. The final factor here is the Vichy French, you know? Uh, and when we do get into World War II, we end up with, with essentially an advanced base in New Caledonia, which is where the AmeriCal division comes from, because it's the American troops from Caledonia, right? The AmeriCal. So, uh, uh, and then we get this huge windfall with the Australians. But a lot of this didn't take place because we just didn't want to provoke the Japanese and have them join the Axis. You know, the great irony here is they do. They do. Now what do we do? Yeah. Uh, Alex Zim's got a follow-up question. Follow-up is, I have read in various places that one of the 
of factors that was inhibiting this cooperation were various, and I don't know whether it's from political sources or from Navy sources, a reluctance to, quote, uh, defend the British Empire, that we were not going to spend American lives to keep the British Empire intact. Well, yeah, there's a whole other narrative about FDR, uh, about the worries about colonialism, and FDR has to sort of do this dance. There's a really great new paper by Ted Lehman out on, on the oil diplomacy of Ted Lehman. Of, so the Japanese are primarily using Dutch East Indies oil, oil in the 1920s, but let's get the Japanese addicted to American oil by the 1930s. And, uh, and, and, and so, so, you know, so there's all this diplomacy and political narrative in the background, uh, but Washington has to be careful. I mean, you know, uh, F FDR only commits to support the British uh, if the Japanese attack at the 11th hour in late 1941. He contacts the British in November, I think, and says, we will support Matador, which is the British plan to seize the Kra Isthmus inside Thailand and to seize Singora. The problem with the British planning for that is they mirror image. They think, well, it's going to take the Japanese a lot of time to build up combat power in Southeast Asia and to transport that fleet across the Gulf of Siam to seize the Kra Isthmus. So, so, so we have time. So even when, when, when Roosevelt commits at the 11th hour that we'll come in and support you so you can execute Matador, uh, you'll have American support. The Dutch are also informed that we'll support them so that if the Japanese attack. But this stuff, you know, if it comes out in the papers, it makes Roosevelt look like he's planning for a war with Japan uh, and supporting the colonial powers. So it's, it's, I, I think something actually does come out in the papers but because Pearl Harbor occurs, it kind of goes away. A leak occurs that Roosevelt has actually promised the British and the Dutch support if the Japanese attack them. There's a, there's a famous article in one of the newspapers where somebody leaks the fact that Roosevelt is going to support the British and the Dutch to defend, to defend their imperial possessions in the Far East. The fascinating thing here is all these assumptions that underline the planning that one by one are annihilated, that air power is going to save the day. Well, the British could keep all their best aircraft back in Britain to defend against the war. So, so uh, you know, we're not going to have a problem with the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean is going to be OK. France isn't going to fall, you know. And they and all of these things undermine their plan for the Far East. So you have to take a global view. You've got to understand what's going on here. Uh, very in depth. We got to uh, jump in on that real quick. Oh, oh, OK, sure. Yeah. Chris, then we'll want to move to an online question. But yeah, just just on the on the topic of fighting to save the British Empire, I think you need to draw a distinction because I deal with this in my book on Burma. By the time you look at strategy debates in 43 and 44, and of course, the, you know, encapsulated in the joke among the Americans that the acronym SEAC for Southeast Asia Command means save England's Asiatic colonies. I think, there, I think you need to draw a distinction between before March, April of 42, when the empire is in fact lost between the Dutch and the British when they lose control of those colonies um before that and after that Be, and i think the narrative that you're looking for did, does the united states really want to commit resources to do nothing more than what is perceived as basically avenging singapore or avenging the loss of the dutch east indies that sort of thing i think that's more more operative then but before that i i think i think my colleagues are right in, in the sense that it's a uh we're going to defend our allies and we're going to defend people that have common interests in the peace and security of Southwest of the Southwest Pacific. Um, and that's certainly true, at least through, like I said, spring 42. We've got uh, an online question that I think it's directed to John, but all three of you uh, should be able to uh, weigh in on. So we'll start with uh, Nathan. It's from uh, David Chesson. Uh, John, you spoke about the unintended consequences of the Washington Naval Treaty on Japan. How might that impact have been mitigated had we relented and given them the 70% ratio they wanted at Washington? They want to start with that. Oh, what a great what ifs. I mean, does it, yeah. they're, they're not, they're not as, as angry, but they still have, I mean, I think they still are going to be expansionistic. Uh, do they build their, their 8 8 fleet? Um, I think that. I, to my personal opinion, once the uh, 
the joint right fleet sales. From 1907 on, I think there was going to be some type of conflict between the United States and Japan. That the Pacific, once Britain kind of focuses more, especially after World War I, on, on the Atlantic and her own position in the Pacific, and she leaves um, the Pacific kind of to, to her former allies, or her, 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 her allies in the United States and Japan, I think there was going to be a reckoning. Um, I, I don't think they're quite as angry. We might not see that that decade of assassination in the 1930s, but I think that we would have just faced a larger Japanese fleet. So I think that they wouldn't have been as angry. <laughs> Maybe there would have been less Japanese politicians assassinated, but I think they still it still would have happened. It was just there was that's good. There was just no way of, of, of stopping that ball rolling. China. The, the gorilla in the room here, guys, is China. This war is all about China. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um and, you know, Stalin's, when Stalin comes into the war, you know, he's practically an axis back member after the molotov ribbentrop Pact. But when he comes into the Grand Alliance, you know, uh, he wants the Japanese army tied down in China by Chiang. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but there's still a problem. The Japanese still manage to screw around. But, so China's the real problem. And so I agree with Nate. I think even if we give the Japanese... The 70 percent ratio which is was their minimal entering position or god forbid have given them parity although they couldn't have built the parity by the way we we could have outbuilt them but what would that have cost probably the great depression in the 1920s and not, the 1920s, not later earlier in the 20s okay or no dos plan because there's no money for it right so because the because it works the washington treaty the dos plan they work they keep the peace and they keep the economic prosperity at bay for a while in you know in in the 1920s so china is the gorilla in the room it's japan's policy in china that's the problem all right but there's this global aspect of we need to tie down the japanese army after june of 1941 so it doesn't go north and so so the anti-colonial piece that got asked is is really good because i, I agree with, with chris to some degree we don't want to get involved with that but roosevelt is already thinking in line with churchill and stalin that you know, if Chang isn't going to be able to tie down the Japanese army anymore, then we're going to have to use the United States Navy and the British and the Dutch to tie down the Japanese uh, here in the southern resource area. OK, so we need to tie the Japanese army down, you know, so that it doesn't go north. We need to make sure it doesn't have any oil for its mechanized forces to fight the Soviets. One of the oil embargo is not just about getting Japan back to the table with Fordell Hall, the oil embargo or the lease embargo, it's really the oil leases and then the British and the Dutch followed suit, is all about denying the, the Japanese war machine the kind of uh, resources it needs to fight a mechanized war to the north. You might go, well, the Japanese aren't a mechanized army. Go look at what Yamashita does in Malaya. That is a mechanized thing. He's got, that is a mechanized combined arms uh, warfare deal that he does. He's got several tank regiments attached to him and he's got trucks and he uses those roads, those railroads and that air power. So, so China's the elephant in the room. And I agree with Nate. I think, I think Japan is still going to be expansive. They're still going to have that, even with, even with the treaty admirals. The treaty admirals are all, they're okay with the 21 demands. I, I see nothing in Kato Tomosoburo's uh, writings and the stuff that he's done and the scholarship of Sadao Asada that indicates that Tomosoburo was at odds with the Tanaka government in terms of the 21 demands in China. So China was always the gorilla in the room. China is still the gorilla in the room for the indo pac So you should realize, I mean, the Pacific War doesn't start in 1941. You could argue it starts in 1931 when Japan starts its inroads. Certainly in 1937 when you have the Marco Polo British incident, uh, the rape of Nanking, and you know, just as the Lusitania sinking was the clock starting in World War One, Panay is the same thing. It's, not if we'll get involved in World War with Japan, it is when that clock was running. The clock was running faster than we thought it was running, but uh, the, the 1930s, again, that extension was happening. Sure. Oh, there was one thing that uh, I know you couldn't cover because you're looking at policy at the highest levels and strategy, but as far as Navy force planning was concerned, once the Washington Treaty was signed, the planning on the Navy side was made easier in the sense that you knew what the limits were. You had a ceiling. You could build up to that. Mm -hmm. And then the issue became when uh, Herbert Hoover was the president, the issue between him and the CNOs was, wait, Mr. President, we want to build up to the ceiling. That's, that's what we've all agreed to. Hoover said, 
you don't need to go there. So there was this very real tension. <coughs> but if you were a Navy force planner, you could say, okay, no battleships for 10 years. What does that mean? Right? And, and you, you start working with what you have. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the two battle cruisers, Lexington and Saratoga. When they joined the fleet, it was it, the, the impact was extraordinary. You had two big carriers. They could put over 100 aircraft on them. And more than that, they could operate in almost any situation, even when the seas were heavy, right? Um, they didn't carry as much air, air power as you would think because of the you know, shape of the ship. But the, the Navy aviators suddenly had something where they could really carry a lot of airplanes. And they, they had strategic mobility in those ships. They had long range high speed. So you, you, you could really start thinking about a force built around large carriers. You weren't going to get them as long as the treaty was enforced, but you could start thinking and practicing and getting ready for what you could do with those. So you see all the debates before the general board. You talked about this, John, yeah. uh, between the, the, the yeah. carriers as, as sort of protecting the battle fleet or the carriers going off. On their own and striking, and you know, then coming back, going out as, a, as an independent wing, um, and all that stuff comes up because of the treaty. Well, then you have the, the London Treaty. The, the side thing is the ancillary. You need to build up. You know how many destroyers and cruisers you have. And that was what the London Treaty is. It gave parity with the Royal Navy, and that the Royal Navy got more light cruisers. And I think we gave, I think, fifty thousand extra tons. You know, they're the, the grand dam. We'll give them that that uh, the bone, and we had more heavy cruisers and. The U.S. and Japanese Navy really focused on heavy cruisers, especially the early ones, as uh, sort of supplemental to the battle line because we weren't building any battleships and battle cruisers. And you should remember that after the Mutsu, the Japanese only built one class of battleship. Okay, the largest ones were built, but still, they only built one more, although they do refit the Congo class battle cruisers into super battleships. But it's really destroyers and cruisers which are going to be used for starting the battle line as well as operating those new aircraft carriers. And I agree with The carrier dogma, the carrier aviation dogma, was written on the lesson in Saratoga. I think we probably should have saved the Saratoga instead of nuking it. Maybe the Ranger has the worst record. But Saratoga was well worth it being a, uh, a, uh, a museum. Well, it, it's the same problem in both the British uh, Royal Navy Officer Corps for planning force structure as it is in the Americans or the Americans. And what I found fascinating, Tom, was that the, the, in the cabinet, uh, uh, the, the First Lord of the Admiralty is making the argument, and this is Monsell that we've got all this catching up to do because we didn't build the limits. The same thing is occurring in the general board, and particularly in the Hoover administration yeah. under Hillary Jones and Mark Bristol and those guys saying, you know, we've still got all of this stuff that we didn't build, that Hoover sacrificed our building programs for more promises of disarmament. Uh, Hoover was trading away disarmament. He puts the Lexington and the Saratoga into layup in 1932 because they're too expensive. He closes down the Brooklyn Naval Yard, which loses in New York in the election, by the way. Um, and, and, and the Naval Officer Corps has the same complaint, which is we still have to make this all up. What happens in the United States that doesn't quite happen in Great Britain, and I think it has to do mostly with air power uh, and, and the air power budget of the air minister and how he controls so much money in Britain, is the Americans get the Naira Act, you know, the National Industrial Recovery Act, where they can build, they get the money, and then they get the legislation with the various bits and travel bills to where they will build two limits. And then fortunately, there's the escalator clauses in the Washington and London Naval Treaties, which are put in there precisely because if the Japanese leave the treaties, now we're not limited to 14 inches, we can build to 16 inches. Of course, the Japanese already have the Yamatos on the table in 18 inches, so it's, it's almost moved. Which is why you have the King George V class, which has more armor but smaller guns, and the North Clarence, which don't have as much armor but more guns. And I will say that um, even though he loses the New York, Roosevelt was able with the Industrial Recovery Act to keep the Navy better thing. As many issues we have about the 1930s and early 40s US Navy, and he couldn't pay me enough to be in a devastator or a, or a Bruce Buffalo goes around. As bad as it was for the Navy, the Army was shooting at model T's covered in tarps that said tank on the side and train. So at least the Navy did get some extra money in that regard. They were in a better standing. Uh, oh, yeah. The, so yeah, the East is that. So yeah, the yeah. The, the, the inner service piece in the United States is, uh, like Chris talked about that as an element in the British. He's absolutely right. 
The, I mean, the United States Navy is the first line of defense in the FDR administration from 1932 on. Mm -hmm. and, and Roosevelt absolutely intends, and Norman said this many, many times, Norman Freeman, you know, the, the strategy is built around the United States Navy as being the first line of defense and as a deterrent to war uh, uh, for the United States. So we don't have nearly that problem that the British have uh, with, with the budget. Uh, but yeah, those contracts are already written. You got to go back and look at allocations versus apportions versus actually fulfilling the contracts. The contracts were actually signed to build the ships for the Butler Cruiser Bill in the Hoover administration, and Hoover refused to honor the contracts. Okay, so he the money was set aside. So when Naira came in with the money, the contracts were already there, and the United States could avoid being in breach of contract and could actually spend that money to build those ships. All right, without Congress, congressional support, but that was the stuff that had already been approved, uh, you know, five years earlier. We got time for one more question. Okay, I'll make it a short question. The answer we'll see. Um, so we we talked about China as the elephant in the room. We talked about Singapore and the focus on Southeast Asia and England. That that contrasts with what Navy and Joint Plan was, which was kind of focused on the Philippines. And getting to whether we could or could not get to the Philippines, the answer, of course, was you know, we, we said at the end we can't get there. Army, you're on your own. Yada yada yada. And there was no thought in the Navy, near as I could tell, on anything in the South Pacific. And the, you know, Tommy Hart was kind of hung out to dry. The Navy knew it couldn't get there to help him, and he realized it. So you have this policy issue of China. You know, we help the British and retain their empire in, in those issues versus how the military plan would be. So, you guys see a, a, a split there, a gap uh, in, in the differences in how the. Well, remember, War Plan Orange is abandoned when the joint, when the Rainbow Plan come about, all right? And the underlying thing for the Rainbow Plans is initially hemispheric defense. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to fight Germany all by ourselves and whatever allies she brings along with her. God forbid the Japanese, okay? So that's Rainbow One. It's only by later with Rainbow Four and Rainbow Five uh, that we get this whole idea that Britain is going to be our aircraft carrier off the, off the coast so that we can do the Europe first strategy. The Soviet Union is going to tie down the bulk of the Wehrmacht, still leaves the problem of Japan. Um, and, and we sort of fall back on the orange plan by default, but it's still the Rainbow plan. And it gives MacArthur and, and Hudson Kimmel a lot more leeway. Uh, and they were actually planning some aggressive moves. Uh, MacArthur was going to do it with B-17 bombers for an active offensive defense of the Philippines uh, with bombers and with submarines. Some of the new fleet boats were sent out to the Philippines and they were going to do, they were going to, they were going to sink Japanese troop convoys. So air power, and so technology was going to solve our problems. Um, at the same time, it's, Wilford's book was, was a revelation to me. The whole idea that we weren't going to put anything into developing a fortified sea line of communication through the South Pacific and Australia and French Polynesia is nonsense. That's what we were doing. Uh, we were fortifying all those bases, Johnson Island, Samoa, Polynesia, all that stuff was being rapidly fortified because there's not a lot of islands, you know, on the Wake Midway circuit. Uh, the islands are all in the south. And of course, the Japanese had the mandate, so we had to go even further south. So there was, and then finally, Lend-Lease. You got to push that Lend-Lease material from Britain through the Burma Road and from the United States. Remember, we're gonna we're gonna give China an air force, and that's also gonna help tie down Japan. So so so, but the Philippines were right off. Uh, I, I think if you if you look at, at at Plan Dog Memo and you think about Turner and you think about Eisenhower. And you think about the guys that are the planners, who are Eisenhower and Turner for the services at the outbreak of the war. Yeah, the Philippines are a write-off. It's going to be uh, it's going to be an economy of force to kind of slow the Japanese down. Yeah, if Hart, if Kimmel can get out there, that's fine. But he's going to have to stop somewhere and have a logistics base. We knew that at the time. All right. And by the way, that mobile logistics base isn't really complete yet. All right. You know, we only decide to build it in 1940, all right, with the Two Ocean Navy Act. So it's a very complicated situation. 
Uh, but it was the right move. The, the abandonment of the Philippines, the kind of writing the Philippines off, the State Department was like, let's just give them their independence. And that way we won't have a problem there. Okay. Um, and, uh, and then Chris's point about everything changes after Singapore falls is, is, is huge. And we do get that huge advanced base of Australia. Uh, so so uh, it's, it's just kind of fascinating the way that works out. But the United States was putting immense efforts into arming and improving harbors and air bases and airstrips along that sea line of communication from the west coast of the United States, west coast of the United States, not Hawaii, to the Far East, French Polynesia, Australia, and, of course, to, to the British dominions and through Burma into China. Just to piggyback on that point real quick, I'll just relate the, uh, if, if you get a chance, look at when Marshall calls Eisenhower a week after Pearl Harbor to Washington and says, what should be our general line of action in the Philippines? To me, this, this reinforces everything you just said. Um, and, and Eisenhower comes back and says, the people of Asia, of China, are watching us in the Philippines. They will excuse defeat. They will not excuse abandonment. And they didn't. We didn't abandon the Philippines. And the fact that we didn't abandon the Philippines and got back to liberate them before the end of the war goes a long way to explaining our position in Asia. So that's part of part one. Part two, though, is what Marshall says immediately after that in response. He says, you're right. Do your best to save them, referring to MacArthur and his garrison, who, by the way, that new strategy we're talking about had only been approved December 1st, 1941. Um, so they don't, they effectively written off the Philippines. They knew it was going to be a lost cause, but there was value. The, the, the value for the Philippines was partly geographic, partly strategic by denying Manila and Manila Bay to the Japanese as long as possible. But there was a great moral and political impetus and imperative to hold the islands as long as possible. And if you look at it from just a purely strategy military standpoint, you get one solution, but if you add that other element to it, it assumes a whole different person, whole different characterization, uh, and a whole different tenor, if you will, than anything else. And I thought the way he obviously carries his words carry away because he had been MacArthur's aide in the Philippines. But one thing I would just add to all this, we talk about interest versus planning, we should keep in mind, just a general idea, that pre the National Security Act, we all think of it now as we're all on the same team. But really, pre-1947, we had two militaries. We had a war department and a navy department. And sometimes we worked and planned together well, and oftentimes we didn't. And if we look at those times, um, you know, Stanton and Walter through the Civil War and others were like, there was a great partnership and they had a good plan and they, they worked through it. That wasn't always the case. So there was going to be some hiccups where admirals and generals and their political masters kind of, you know, they don't always, they're speaking different languages. And I think we see that. Uh, certainly in Hawaii and the Philippines. Yeah, yeah, for you young guys, think of it this way. We've got two secretaries of defense in 1941. Okay. And, uh, uh, Stinson, now war, Secretary of War, formerly Secretary of State under Hoover. <laughs> uh, so you've got, you know, you've got the sec uh, you've got Secretary for War, and he's one Secretary of Defense, and you've got the Secretary of Navy right now. Who's the other Secretary of Defense? Okay. So that's what you've got. There's a reason why later on they put somebody above them to, to make them. And that works out really well, doesn't it? <laughs> and to jump in here just to uh, play on Dr. Holmes' question about, you know, the Washington Tree simplifies force plan in a way. Yeah. But I want to direct it to Chris sure. and, and Nate to, to discuss that from the British perspective. But, and, but then tie it into your arguments. You know, Chris says, you know, Chris argued uh, well that the British lost the ground. You argued that they passed the torch. So, so tie in the, the treaty system, force planning and structure from your perspective, eating arguments. So Adam Toons, the historian, uh, argues that the British Abandoning the two parts again. For those who don't know the two parts again, it was that the Royal Navy could beat the next two largest navies, you know, Trafalgar, or the French and Spanish Navy combined. It doesn't matter, Nelson's going to beat them. Britain has to realize that she can't outbuild, outspend the United States. The industrial power is just too much. There's an argument that one of the reasons that Britain and France assist the Confederacy is that they're trying to slow down the American industrial juggernaut of the 19th century. They knew we were going to catch up with them. So if you can get them to here are some of their ships. If you can get them to kind of agree to some kind of parity, you don't have to worry so much about spending that much. So you will agree 
the least worst scenario is you know getting rid of the same amount of new stuff. You know, you can't outspend them, you can't build them, much like the Soviet Union realizes, you know, it's like that old TV show Storage Wars, the one guy who would always just outspend anybody. I mean, the, the, the Soviets is like, you know, yeah, 14 billion rubles, you know, regular, you know, he would just outspend them. Same thing, we could just outbuild them at will. We were, and Wilson was doing that. We were going to build a navy that was could literally intended below the Royal Navy out of the water. We just go, you know, how good it was going to be, and the Lexington has battle cruisers. The best thing that happened was that they didn't become battle cruisers. They had big guns, no armor, they probably wouldn't have lasted very long had somebody shooting back at them. They were worse armored than the hood. You can find that. So the British get to keep it a dual monarchy. Um, it's not like their dual monarchy with the Dutch Navy where they were sort of a senior partner, like a, if you know anything about the, the Habsburg Empire, it was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but whenever the Hungarian built showed up, they would go in a room with portraits of Austrian victories, just to remind them who was the bigger side. That was the Royal Navy and Dutch Navy uh, position. Here, they will agree to at least a partnership. Um, so I think that's the best that they thought they could do. They knew they weren't going to outspend them. And then you know, the 10-year plan, now they're going to have to, to compete with the New World Air Force and the British Army with funds. So um, things got, after the conference, they still thought they had a good hand. Once the economic realities of the World War hits them, then they realize um, they're going to lose no matter what. But I think in Newton's initially, they played the best hand they were dealt with. There was any Royal Navy, British military, or political uh, official who thought that they were going to be as dominant, as strong as they were before the war um, was, was in dreamland. I, I generally agree with a lot of what was said. I will say that the, the British, um, the, the Washington Naval Treaty was w but one part. And that's why I put it in there as first, but it's it's first among several equals. The budgeting, the inner service, right? You put all those factors together and it really dragged down, um, you know, with the, with the Royal Navy in the interwar period. Uh, that the Naval Treaty started it because, yes, it's a recognition of the, the reality that the United States, if regardless of what happens, either they sign it away at the, tre at the treaty or the United States completes the building program that is currently authorized by Congress at that time, uh, the United States and the Royal Navy are going to be at parity in the foreseeable future. The question is under what terms? And one of the things that I find very interesting, if you haven't looked at it, I do recommend Russell Grenfell's book, Main Fleet to Singapore, because he's got some very interesting analysis on this. And he talks about how the United States Navy was assuming that their one front was going to be Japan. And Grenfell actually takes a little bit of an issue with some of the presentations earlier uh, or, or counters it and says it wasn't just Japan. There was also some question of fascist Italy. And there was that Britain had a more global concern uh with its navy and britain really needed that extra that little extra is the argument that he makes and i think that's something that the british kind of overlooked in that moment they looked at it as a purely numbers and economics game at least that's the way i get it and again it's, it's not the navy necessarily that's making these points it's but it's the politicians that at the end of the day are looking at it from a numbers and an economic and a, a policy standpoint and they're overlooking the long-term implications is, is parity with the United States Navy desirable? Yes. But is it really the best long-term interest of the empire? Because do we have the same interests and do we need the same force levels as the U.S. Navy? Would a 10% increase over the U.S. Navy be enough? You know, I don't see that discussion really happening. And it was short-sighted. For them to, and it's to me, it's one of the more interesting. If you start thinking about it, one of the more interesting what ifs. What if the Navy, Royal Navy, had insisted on a little bit extra over the U.S. Navy, or had not held to the treaty system quite as long as it did? You know, might it have been in a better position? 39, 40, 41, pre Pearl Harbor. Well, I think the, the, the Royal Navy Officer Corps was arguing that, Chris. It's just that their political masters didn't buy those arguments. Oh, there was so, there political will. You're absolutely right about that. So hoodwinked by the Americans, the torch was passed. The word I'm going to use is bully. It's Roger Key's words. And Roger Key said to Franny Colby, a competent FDR, they're having lunch in London. And she goes, well, what do you think about, uh, you know, this new spirit of Anglo-American cooperation? And he goes, 
I think you guys should build whatever you want as long as we can build whatever we want. But you know you can be, uh, you're not really our enemies, but sometimes you bully us. You could be a bit of a bully, all right? And he knew these words were going to go right back to the FDR, and FDR sent him right to the general board. So this idea of bullying, because that's what happens at Versailles. You really have to start at Versailles with this, with, with Wilson blackmailing the British into the League of Nations and then using the naval building plan as his sacrificial land to get that agreement. But by 1921 at Washington, the League of Nations is not on the table anymore. Now what are the British going to give up? And the United States really bully the British into this. And they bully them into it with, we can simply outbuild you. And the Japanese absolutely want to avoid that. They don't want an American, Anglo-American arms race because it will be a disaster for them economically. All right. So it's a so it's that that kind of bullying thing that the Americans and the Americans don't see it as bullying. They just see it as reasonable people agreeing on a rational course of action. Right. I will say that, that we should remember for the Washington Treaty when it ends, the one bone the British do get is it only covers capital vessels, capital ships. Hughes wanted to be across the board, same ratio from a little tugboat to the biggest bow cruiser. But the Washington Treaty only does capital ships. It's the London Treaty that you know we like we do the cruisers. The British get slightly more light cruisers for their global empire, and the U.S. and Japan focus on their heavy cruisers, which are going to target those logistics trains. That's the that's at least the reality. Of course, once the money starts being spent, the, the British realize. What's the one thing that doesn't get limited at all these companies? Airplanes. 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 Okay. The thing that, uh, that limits them, or navies at any rate, is inner service competition. Mm -hmm. We get two minutes. Yeah. All right, just a small thing, is, and I, I'm sorry I'm so late. Um, when you talk about the treaty and the numbers, remember that the British have a largely worn out fleet of ships that were mostly designed well before the war, and they know it. And the way they look at Jutland makes it worse for them. Is they kid themselves about what happened to Germany. When they buy the new battle cruisers that get canceled at Washington or after Washington, those are explicitly bargaining ships in what they expect to be an arms control agreement. And remember also that the U.S. Congress is about to kill the U.S. program. Yeah. And one of the remarkable things is that British intelligence is so awful that they don't catch on. So you're watching also a terrible intelligence failure on the part of the British. It's as though uh, the rest of the world is such slime that they don't matter, which is a sort of typical attitude. Well, it happens in London, too. I mean, they, it's just like they're not even paying attention. I mean, uh, Coolidge passes the Butler Cruiser Bill, and it, it doesn't happen. None of that stuff gets built. And so the British are in a much stronger position in London in 1930 um, than they realize. If they'd only kind of looked at it, and, and again, with the Americans being an open society, it is. It's something, it's, I don't know what their liaison officers are, were doing in Washington at the time. Why right. they weren't picking up on the fact that they were in a much stronger position well, to make demands of the United if States. If you look at the documents, there's no evidence that they understand. The other thing is that, that arms control becomes an obsession with British government, which is basically too cheap to live. And... Uh, their attitude throughout is that, that the more agreements you make, the happier you're going to be. And oh, by the way, there is an attempt to limit airplanes in a general uh, conference by the League of Nations, the main impact of which is the RAF is terrified that if the Royal Navy gets more airplanes, they will suffer. Their bombers will suffer. Bombers, which, of course, are unbelievably effective against, what, mice or something. Um, and that's the reason that the British do not learn to pack more airplanes into ships like Eagle. That's explicit in their records. It's the dumbest damn thing you could ever imagine. Or, of course, it's an impossible arms control idea. Well, one of the great what ifs in the end is that uh, instead of just canceling Hood's three younger sisters, maybe building two of the hulls and doing something like the Lexington or oh, so right. they would have a large blue carrier that would have been better than Eagle or Oh, no question. Ages. No question. And, and the, the answer is that they were always willing to go for something better than they could get. So when the Board of Admiralty thinks about canceling them, oh, the, the other problem is the British Navy has no concept of economic reality ever. And if you want a good example of that, look at their attempts at a post-war program in 1944, when they're basically bankrupt. 
and they, they lay out the post-war fleet that the Empire needs. And you won't believe the fantasy of mom. <laughs> There's something in their education that wasn't, you know? I think we can carry on this conversation in the uh, in the break room during the break. Thank you very much. Well, so all you need is Mark Mandel is here. And, and Sorry, we'll <laughs> right, no, well done. <laughs>